sense. I mean, that's 1.3 million children refugees in just over two weeks. It is the, in speed and, and scale, the biggest refugee crisis we've seen since World War II. I spend every day at the train station watching husbands and wives farewell each other. Fathers sort of get down on their haunches and explain to their sons and little daughters, you know, why they're going to a country they've not heard of and why dad is staying behind. And that's those families 
at that point. It's taken them usually three or five days to get to that point through freezing conditions, nights in bunkers or worse, makeshift bunkers and basements. I saw children in hospitals in ICU, in incubators, they cannot leave, or at least it's very, it's much more complicated and dangerous for them to leave. So these emergency medical supplies that UNICEF gets in, surgical equipment, you know, midwifery equipment, because mum's having babies in bunkers and makeshift, makeshift maternity wards, that kind of supplies that UNICEF is getting in are life-saving. Child protection, tracking and tracing, which UNICEF does well, but is an enormous ask. We're very worried about trafficking right now, given the scale. Education, you know, you're looking at a million refugees in Poland. These kids need some normality. That goes hand in hand with trauma support. And then the basics, water, sanitation. recently doing water trucking in Mariupol, but it's not to the scale we need because every time there's talk of a humanitarian corridor, it's broken. I go from what Ukrainians say to me and of the hundreds of families, usually mums and children who are good enough in their moments of deep stress and sorrow to talk to me as they were leaving, I did not speak to a person who did not want to be back. They wanted to be back in their words, you know, a physio who wants to be with her, her patients, you know, or a teacher with her students or a daughter with her dad. Everyone wants to be back. <laughs>